the most stupendous scientific imposition upon the public was the Great Moon Hoax, published in the columns of the New York Sun, in the months of August and September, 1835. At the period when the wonderful yarn first appeared, the science of astronomy was engaging particular attention, and all works on the subject were eagerly bought up and studied by immense masses of people. The real discoveries of the younger Herschel, whose fame seemed destined to eclipse that of the elder sage of the same name, and the eloquent startling works of Dr. Dick, which the Harpers were republishing, in popular form, from the English edition, did much to increase and keep up this peculiar mania of the time, until the whole community at last were literally occupied with but little else than stargazing. Dick's works on the sidereal heavens, celestial scenery, the improvement of society, etc., were read with the utmost avidity by rich and poor, old and young, in season and out of season. To the highly educated and imaginative portion of his readers, the doctor's glowing stories, full of the grandest speculations as to the starry worlds around us, their wondrous magnificence and ever-varying aspects of beauty and happiness were inexpressibly fascinating. It was at the very height of the furor above mentioned, that one morning the readers of the Sun were thrilled with the announcement in its columns of certain great astronomical discoveries lately made by Sir John Herschel, at the Cape of Good Hope, purporting to be a republication from a supplement to the Edinburgh Journal of Science. The heading of the article was striking enough, yet was far from conveying any adequate idea of its contents. When the latter became known, the excitement went beyond all bounds, and grew until the Sun office was positively besieged with crowds of people of the very first class, vehemently applying for copies of the issue containing the wonderful details. The opening of the narrative was in the highest review style, and the majestic, yet subdued, dignity of its periods, at once claimed respectful attention, while its perfect candor, and its wealth of accurate scientific detail exacted the homage of belief from all but cross-grained and inexorable skeptics. It commences thus. In this unusual addition to our journal, we have the happiness to make known to the British public, and thence to the whole civilized world, recent discoveries in astronomy, which will build an imperishable monument to the age in which we live, and confer upon the present generation of the human race a proud distinction through all future time. It has been poetically said, that the stars of heaven are the hereditary regalia of man, as the intellectual sovereign of the animal creation. He may now fold the zodiac around him with a loftier consciousness of his mental superiority. The writer then eloquently descanted upon the sublime achievement by which man pierced the bounds that hemmed him in, and with sensations of awe approached the revelations of his own genius in the far-off heavens, and with intense dramatic effect described the younger Herschel surpassing all that his father had ever attained, and by some stupendous apparatus about to unveil the remotest mysteries of the sidereal space. It was claimed that the Edinburgh Journal was indebted for its information to Dr. Andrew Grant, who had, for very many years, been the scientific companion, first of the elder and subsequently of the younger Herschel, and had gone with the latter in September, 1834, to the Cape of Good Hope, whither he had been sent by the British government, acting in conjunction with the governments of France and Austria, to observe the transit of Mercury over the disk of the Sun, an astronomical point of great importance to the navigation of the world. This transit was not calculated to occur before the 7th of November, 1835, but Sir John Herschel set out nearly a year in advance, for the purpose of thoroughly testing a new and stupendous telescope, devised by himself under this peculiar inspiration, and infinitely surpassing anything of the kind ever before attempted by mortal man. It has been discovered by previous astronomers and among others, by Herschel's illustrious father, that the sidereal object becomes dim in proportion as it is magnified, and that, beyond a certain limit, the magnifying power is consequently rendered almost useless. Thus, an impassable barrier seemed to lie in the way of future close observation, unless some means could be devised to illuminate the object to the eye. The elder Herschel, with a magnifying power had calculated that he could distinguish an object on the moon's surface not more than 122 yards in diameter. His son, with six times the power, could see an object there only 22 yards in diameter. But, 
For any further advance in power and light, the way seemed insuperably closed until a profound conversation with the great savant and optician, Sir David Brewster, led Herschel to suggest to the latter the idea of the readoption of the old-fashioned telescopes which threw their images upon reflectors in a dark apartment, and then the illumination of these images by the intense light used in the ordinary illuminated microscope. At this suggestion, Brewster is represented by the voracious chronicler as leaping with enthusiasm from his chair, exclaiming in rapture to Herschel, Thou art the man. The suggestion, thus happily approved, was immediately acted upon, and a subscription, headed by that liberal patron of science, the Duke of Sussex, was backed by the reigning King of England with his royal word for any sum that might be needed to make up £70,000, the amount required. Accordingly, on the 4th of September, 1834, with a design to become perfectly familiar with the working of his new gigantic apparatus, and with the southern constellations, before the period of his observations of Mercury, Sir John Herschel sailed from London, accompanied by Dr. Grant and a large party of the best English workmen. By the 10th of January, everything was complete. Operations then commenced forthwith, and so, too, did the special wonder of the readers. Here came in his grand stroke, informing the world of complete success in obtaining a distinct view of objects in the moon fully equal to that which the unaided eye commands of terrestrial objects at the distance of a hundred yards, affirmatively settling the question whether the satellite be inhabited, and by what order of beings. This announcement alone was enough to take one's breath away, but when the green marble shores of the mare Nubium, the mountains shaped like pyramids, and of the purest and most dazzling crystallized, wine-colored amethyst, dotting green valleys skirted by round-breasted hills, summits of the purest vermilion fringed with arching cascades and buttresses of white marble glistening in the sun and the whole town went moon-mad. But even these immense pictures were surpassed by the lunatic animals discovered. First came the herds of brown quadrupeds very like a bison, and with a tail resembling that of the boss grunians. Then a creature, which the hoax man naively declared would be classed on earth as a monster of a bluish lead color, about the size of a goat, with a head and a beard like him, and a single horn, slightly inclined forward from, the perpendicular. Next in the procession of discovery, among other animals of less note, was presented a quadruped with an amazingly long neck, head like a sheep, bearing two long spiral horns, white as polished ivory, and standing in perpendiculars parallel to each other. But all these beings faded into insignificance compared with the first sight of the genuine lunatics, or men in the moon, four feet high, covered, except in the face, with short, glossy, copper-colored hair, and with wings composed of a thin membrane, without hair, lying snugly upon their backs from the top of their shoulders to the calves of their legs, with faces of a yellowish flesh color, a slight improvement on the large orangutan. The glowing mention of the inhabitants of this wonderful valley was a superior race of lunatics, as beautiful and as happy as angels, spread like eagles on the grass, eating yellow gourds and red cucumbers, and played with by snow-white stags, with jet-black horns. Although evidently creatures of order and subordination, and very polite, were seen indulging in amusements which would not be deemed within the bounds of strict propriety on this degenerate ball. The story wound up rather abruptly by referring the reader to an extended work on the subject by Herschel, which has not yet appeared. Nearly everybody, the gravest and the wisest, too, was completely taken in at the time, and the sun, reaped an increase of more than 50,000 to its circulation. In fact, there it gained the foundation of its subsequent prolonged success. Its proprietors sold no less than $25,000 worth of the moon hoax over the counter, even exhausting an edition of 60,000 in pamphlet form. And who was the author? A literary gentleman, who had devoted very many years of his life to mathematical and astronomical studies, and was at the time connected as an editor with the son Richard Adams Locke. Locke declared that his original object in writing the moon story was to satirize some of the extravagances of Dr. Dick. Whatever may have been his object, his hit was unrivaled, and for months the press of Christendom, but far more in Europe than here, teemed with it, until Sir John Herschel was actually compelled to come out with a denial over his own signature.